Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, January 12, 2017, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank everybody for being here. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule, and I am humbled by your presence. So what do we talk about? Well, first of all, we're going to continue the discussion on the overall market, obviously, and are we in a new bull leg? And also, we're going to take a look at the sector action, too, obviously, and then we'll get to your stock picks. Um, later in the show. So uh, any questions you may have, just uh, fire them off. Um, while we're on the slides, keep them to the slides just so I don't get uh, too mixed up. And then um, as we get to the charts, you can ask about questions in general. When it comes to individual stock picks, if you haven't been here before, you can ask about as many stocks as you want. Just ask about each one at a time and then hit return. So today I'm going to talk about 17 trading resolutions for 2017. Yesterday, I'm thinking, uh, what am I going to talk about today? And then it's like, you know, I have this column out there, and I think, uh, given that it is 2017, I haven't talked about any any looking ahead things to do. So let's do that this week. There's a disclaimer, as you know, you can lose money trading, or as I often sum it up, all predictions about the future. A lot of stuff can happen between now and then. All right, well, let's talk about 17 trading resolutions for 2017. So number one is I will only take trades when conditions are conducive for my methodology. Well, as you know, I'm a big proponent of trend following. And in fact, the only way to ever make money on a trade, obviously, is to capture a trend. So my feeling is, why not be a trend follower all of the time? So that means the market should be trading cleanly, the overall market that is, and it should be trading in an obvious or fairly obvious direction. Now, it doesn't mean that you don't trade when things are choppy or sideways. It just means that you become more and more selective. Uh, throughout most of 2016, as you know, the market was pretty choppy, and we still had quite a few trades, and we did okay in spite of that sideways market. But we did that through being very, very selective. And, of course, as usual, I'm going to beat the dead horse in a little while about being patient. And that's important. Sometimes you have to be really patient when these things are happening. But the market obviously should be in a pretty obvious trend. And if not, just make sure you're super-duper selective. How's that for a technical term in your trades? Now, the next thing that you want to do is you want to be... or you want to carefully plan out all your trades ahead of time and then work diligently to follow that plan. And I say it quite often, and now it's cliche, but you have to plan the trade and trade the plan. You have to plan while things are static because as soon as the market opens, obviously things are no longer static and that new information is flowing into the market. And as Montier wrote about, stress goes up when information is changing or uncertain. Well, obviously, as soon as the market begins trading, information is what? Changing and uncertain. So you must plan as much ahead of time as possible while things are static. And I often say this, and I know those of you who are uh, fans of the show and come here often, uh, just bear with me because today, as usual, I'm going to have to do a little harsh beating. You know, my wife often tells the harsh beat about the story in and of itself. I asked my wife, you know, what do you think about the column? It's like, well, you know, you say, you say a lot of the same shit over and over. And it's like, well, yeah, I'm going to keep saying that until you people get it. And, uh, and maybe some of it needs to sink into my head sometimes, too. But what amazes me is, in spite of all my preaching and teaching, people still do whatever they want. And they don't follow the plan. And the, the example I can give over and over again, because it happens nearly daily, is... I put out a recommendation, buy XYZ at $7 and put a stop in at 6 and take partial profits at 8 And then each day we look at the trailing stop. Hopefully we're bumping that stop up. And I put all that in my game plan, which I do at night while I'm drinking a big cup of coffee. And then I make a recording and show the spreadsheet of all this stuff. And if you go to the homepage uh, of my website, there's one that's about two or three days old after the webinar, of course. And you can watch uh, the service there, or you can sign up for the delayed service and follow along a week 
uh, behind or so to see exactly what I mean. But in spite of laying out an exact game plan, and I understand you might have a question or two here or there, but as far as an exact game plan, and I think one comes to mind, it was like enter at 640, and the next day it's stuck, goes 640, 645, 670, it keeps going. So the following day, I get a get an email. Hey, Dave, stock uh, triggered yesterday, but I didn't take it. What do I do now? It's like, well, eh, I don't know. It's a little bit a uh, little bit tougher decision now because now it's like, well, it's much higher. It's kind of darn if you do it, darn if you don't. If you don't get in, then it's going to keep on going higher. If you do get in, then it turns out to be the exact top. So the more you deviate from the plan, the more difficult your life will become. Another thing that uh, often happens is I'll have uh, a stop in place on a trade and it'll get taken out. And, you know, I, I wish I wish every trade I, I made was profitable, but it, it's not. That's that's reality. But I get an email from somebody and they'll tell me and I know those told the story over and over, but I'm going to keep telling it because I keep getting emails and it's like, hey, Dave, I'm down 50 percent. That's stinky you recommend. And I'm like, I never recommended that. I never would recommend that. The thing has been headed down for six months. When did you buy it? Well, I bought it six months ago when you recommended it. I was like, wait a minute. Let me go look at that. And like, up, oh, sure enough, I recommended it. And sure enough, it triggered it. Sure enough, it stopped out. But they're still holding on, even though they're now down 50 percent. Now, one really bad trade, one thing I'm going to talk a lot about, in a few minutes, is preservation of capital. But one really bad trade can really do a number on your account. And the good news is the flip side is true, too. One really good trade could nearly make you year or often could make you year. So very important to follow that plan. I know it's cliche, but plan the trade and then trade the plan. Now, the other thing, too, is you only want to take trades that trigger an entry. And as I often say, this is a little tough to quantify, but missing bad trades is vitally important. You miss bad trades in, in two particular ways, or I should say you avoid bad trades in two specific ways, I should say. Number one, you're selective to begin with, and, and I keep jumping ahead, as you can tell, from those of you who read the column. But you want to be very selective to begin with. And the second thing you do is you want to make sure you wait for an entry. And that's the same type of email I get, too. It's like we'll have a stock and it'll just absolutely implode and never triggers. And then, of course, I'll get an email out here somewhere six months from now and say, hey, Dave, what do I do with this stock? Well, we completely avoided the trade because it never hit an entry. But people will take it anyway. They'll think, you know what, it's pretty much a bargain down here at 14. Dave said to buy up at 18 and a half. So if he liked it 18 and a half, it must be great down here at 12 or 14, whatever the case may be. And that's not how trend following works. A trend may have reversed. Now, as I often say, and I was getting a little ahead of myself a minute ago, but as I often say, it's tough to quantify missing, losing trades, but it's vitally important. And then one thing I thought about this morning is, Maybe it's not so tough to quantify. I could go in and I could look at every one of these uh, trades that didn't trigger that was avoided and look at where they are now. And I could show you that the account would probably be wiped out had you taken those trades. And there's no need to go in and do that. Just take my word for it. If you keep taking trades and you're either A, not out of your stop, or B, taking trades that do not trigger, then you're going to be in a lot of trouble longer term. Now, this is what I was getting to. Druckenmiller once said that the way to build long-term returns is through preservation of capital and home runs. And the way you do that is first, as they often say, garbage in, garbage out. That's one thing I learned very early when uh, I began my programming career in college, learning how to program computers. Quickly learned that you garbage in, garbage out. That's an old computer term, and it makes a lot of sense. Same thing goes for trades. So you want to be in the best trades to begin with. And whenever I find a chart that I really, really like or, or a potential trade, I want to be in that stock for a long, long time. People say, hey, what's your, what's your holding period? And I say, 
10 years at least, hopefully longer. But obviously I'll get stopped out a little sooner than that. But every now and then we'll catch one and we're able to ride it for a long, long time. So that preservation of capital is through, and again, we're, I'm getting ahead of myself. We're going to talk quite a bit about patience in a minute, but it's being patient once you're in that trade, being patient waiting for that trade, and then being willing to, be willing to allow yourself to get stopped out, either via a trailing stop or an initial protective stop. So again, this is one, uh, as you know, usually I'd say 99% or nearly all of the um, examples I use come straight from the trading service. So if you're on a delayed service, you'll see this one in a few days. But this one, we had an entry up here. And then notice that so far, it's just kind of imploded and it didn't trigger an entry. In fact, I took it off as uh, an official setup. Now, I bet you 100 bucks somebody's going to email me about a month from now and say, hey, Dave, remember that FRTA? I know it didn't trigger, but I took it anyway. What, what should I do now? Well, what you should do or what you should have done is just avoided the trade to begin with and then shout next. And one thing that I wanted to say, and I got it out of Kirk report. And I think I mentioned it last week. I got to go back and dig out those old Kirk reports and see who said it. So I want to give everybody anyone credit. Uh, who says something that I use, and I can't remember who said it, but uh, basically they said, we spend a lot of time doing a lot of research that we'll never use, or that we never use. And it's in one of my columns, so the, um, I, could, I guess I could dig through my own columns and find it. But that's true, and that's when you're, you're doing that, there's a couple of ways that that shakes out. One, it shakes out of that you do your homework, and you find something that looks great like this, and then it continues to, to implode, and you never take the trade because you're following the plan. But that's okay. You just keep chipping, chipping away at it, and eventually you catch a nice winner or two. And, again, that can make a year. So that's important to be willing to forego that research. The other time you forego the research would be when things are choppy. And it's been a grind over the last year or so up until recently. Beginning year was okay because the market sold off hard. Middle of the year was just kind of choppy and sideways. I think we're, we were in a little bit of limbo, probably waiting on the election. That's probably what caused it. But we did okay because I grinded it out, and it was really hard just looking at stock after stock after stock and saying, guys, I can't find anything. And in some cases, hey, we finally found something, and then, then it didn't trigger. So it's like, geez. So it was tough because all that research, it's like, why did I waste so much time? Well, I wasted so much time because through doing that hard work, I found a few decent stocks that were worth trading. And that's what I tell a lot of people, and it's actually struck a chord with a few people, so I'm glad I actually said it, or I say it over and over, is that if you're going to be on the trading service, or if, you, if you're going to trade, don't feel like you have to go on alone. Hire me to be part of your staff. Treat me as part of your staff. Somebody took that as a negative thing. No, I don't mind. You know, as long as you pay me, you can... Call me what you want. Just don't call me late for dinner, okay? But treat me as part of your staff. And if you don't care to or you don't have the time to do the homework, I'm here. I'm going to do the homework, okay? Especially when things are choppy. Now, again, being a dead horse, and I keep getting ahead of myself, but you definitely want to pick the best and leave the rest. And that goes back to the garbage in and garbage out. And again, hey, Dave, you say a lot of the same stuff over and over. Yeah, I know. But you'd be surprised how many people, especially smart people, because smart people try to outsmart the markets. But you'd be surprised how many charts people send me that look like an electrocardiogram. I kid you not. And I don't want to pick on, I don't want to be mean to anybody today, but I'm sure at some point in this presentation, somebody's going to ask me about a stock that looks like an electrocardiogram. Now, somebody a while back got upset and, and stop coming because he says, Dave, you just beat me up all the time. It's like, well, you know, maybe trading's not for you. I don't know, but uh, it, it needs to be pretty darn obvious. And if you don't know if a stock is worthwhile trading or not, then just do something real simple. Linda Rasky once said, all you need is one pattern to be successful. So what I would say is just do something like persisted pullbacks. Make sure the stock goes up day after day after day, approximately 20 days or so. Make sure that this is a significant trend higher relative to the volatility of the stock. Make sure you can draw a line 
through nearly every bar mathematically. That's equivalent to linear regression, but you know me, I like to keep it simple and just draw a bar through as many lines as possible. Make sure you can draw a big blue arrow on the screen. In this case, it's red, I guess. And then look for something like either a TKO, and you can find that video on my website in recent commentary, or just a generic type of pullback. So trade one pattern and then you won't have to worry about something like electric cardiogram. This thing is going to be self-regulating, okay? So this will never look like this. If you can't find any of these, then maybe you shouldn't be trading that particular point in time. So get good at one thing before moving on to the next. If you can't trade one pattern and be successful, you're not going to trade 10, and that's where a lot of people get confused. Okay, number five, you're going to have to be patient. Tom Petty once said, obviously, the waiting is the hardest part, and it is. And this is where I was getting a little further ahead of myself, but there's three forms of patience. The patience to wait for the setup, the patience to follow through, wait for the setup to trigger, to stick with the setup once it triggers, and to not micromanage yourself out of a trade. And again, I'm getting a little further ahead of myself, but all this stuff is intertwined, as you'll see. And being patient is not easy. We're people of action. By, by us people, I mean us educated people with careers who are hardworking, like you people here today you doctors, you lawyers, you dog trainers, and uh, automatic transmission mechanics. And if I'm leaving anybody out, let me know if you do anything um, interesting. Your uh, life coaches, I think we have a few of those guys. But you got to where you were by working hard and doing something. And trading sometimes is nothing to do. You still have to do your homework, but again, you're going to throw off a lot of research that you'd never ever going to use. And that's okay. So getting back to the homework, you're going to do your homework and leave no stun, stone unturned. And nearly daily somebody emails me about a stock. So I know a lot of you guys are paying careful attention to what I'm saying and what I'm doing. So I know that I better look at every single stock that might be viable and quite a few that aren't just to make sure I leave no stone unturned. And that means looking at a couple thousand stocks, which include IPOs over the last 500 days or so, um, tradable universe, and that's going to be about 2,300. I'll look at probably the top 80% of those because once we get further down, the volatility drops much lower than the market or some people would call the beta is too low for me to trade. By the way, I get emails all the time asking me about different stocks, and, and one thing is uh, we were talking about recently with someone is that you're not going to beat the market with stocks that are less volatile than the overall market. And one of the problems with that, if you are trading a stock that's less volatile, and I saw somewhere where somebody had did some research and claimed that, that less volatile stocks, uh, you could beat the market with them. And, and I'm going to disagree because the problem is, I think, what, which was uh, – left out of their study is that the black swan event can occur in any type of stock. And sometimes it, it catches people most off guard in a less volatile stock. So if you get hit with a black swan type of event in a low volatility type of stock, it's going to take a long time to recover from that because you're not making a lot of money fast in all those other stocks in there. So I know that's a conversation for another day, but you're going to have to, look for the more volatile stocks, and then, again, leave no stone unturned. More volatile within reason. Now, they'll have a, probably a few stocks come up in a little while. Uh, that volatility is just crazy. I'm sure somebody will bring up uranium stock. They, they, they look great, but the volatility is so crazy, it's just too much, okay, too much of a good thing. And we'll get to, uh, we'll talk a little bit about historical volatility when we get to the actual chart. So, again, I know that my clients are out there. Many of them are actually doing their homework too. So I better make sure I find a stock 
or they don't find a stock that I didn't find myself. Otherwise, I've got some splaining to do. And one of the cool things, at least it excites, you know, from an egotistical standpoint, I think it's pretty cool, is when my clients get on the same page as me and their lists look a lot like mine. And that's the point where it's like, okay, you got it. You understand what you're doing. Now's the time to just keep me on, on staff. Maybe I'll find something that you did, and that, that makes me work even harder to make sure that I can continue to hopefully find something that they didn't. Now, number seven is another one of these beating heart, beating a dead horse things is I will only trade the charts and ignore all other extraneous information. So news is noise. First of all, you can't predict the news. And even if you could, you will not, cannot predict the reaction to it. The reaction is often either muted, like nothing happens, and quite often the opposite because it's baked into the cake. And sometimes it's a little bit of all of the above. I felt pretty sure what the outcome of this election would be, but I, I, I didn't know for a fact, and I certainly didn't want to make any bets on it. And as that began to play out, the market began to tank. The market was limit down overnight. But then what happened? It, it totally reversed and then it went up, and it's been going up as a general statement ever since. So even though that was a bit of a surprise to the system, the system reacted in the opposite way, or, or did it reverse that thing? It reacted normally, like, because, hey, wait a minute, this is not going as planned, and so it sold off, and then all of a sudden it's like, well, wait, wait a minute, maybe this won't be so bad for the market, then it turned around and went up. So it, it, even if you could predict the news, you can't predict the outcome. And as I often say, if you could use news in your trading, a lot more journalists would become traders. And as, as I often say, too, is, Read my lips, I ignore all news. And no matter how many times I beat the dead horse on this, what happens? Well, I get an email. Hey, Dave, uh, the stock is earnings coming up. What should I do? Well, just ignore them and follow the plan. And again, it doesn't mean that those earnings can't affect the stock negatively if you're long, but you don't know what the reaction is going to be. And if you're going to be a longer-term trend follower, remember, we're a swing trader, but we stick with positions as long as they move in our favor. We're trying to make that transition into the longer-term trend following. You're going to hold that position through earning periods. We've been in one since last February. It's almost February now, or will be in a few weeks. And guess what? We've had four earning periods during that year roughly okay and i have no idea whether they were good bad or indifferent and as i often say greg morris puts up a chart and it's a i think it's an aol chart over like 15 years or something it says well we had two gulf wars in here we had 9 11 we had the i think the asia crisis and he names about 10 or 12 other news events and then he also says we had i don't know 40 earnings periods and even if you could pick out the earnings periods, can you tell me if the earning periods were good or bad? And I think that's a, a, a great little thing to point out. It's a good little speech. And uh, I'm working on a beginner's course, which I'll talk about in a minute. And I thought I could crank it out really quickly, but it was, it was weird. I was looking at my charts, but charts were 2050. They were current charts, and now they're 2016. So it's probably a year and a half in the making. But I hope to start a recording real soon. And one thing that amazes me is that I was looking at the, I, I did like an S&P chart, and now I did, I had to redo it for 2016. And hopefully I'll have it done so I don't have to do what for 2017. But I started listing all the things that happened during the year. It's like there was some stuff with China. There was a civil war over in Syria, ISIS attacks, uh, all kinds of crazy things. Pokemon Go. Pokemon went, you know, <laughs> Pokemon gone, all kinds of crazy things happened in 2015, 2016, and you'd be very hard-pressed to pick them out on a chart. And the point I was making earlier was that, okay, well, you could probably see where the Trump election came in on the chart and say, well, there's a Trump election, you know, but you got to remember the initial reaction to that was just the opposite of what the market ended up doing. Now, no matter what you think you know on a trade, 
you could be wrong. So you need to place a protective stop on every trade. And no one knows what the, what a market will do. That goes for you, that goes for me, and that goes for the guy who screams on TV. If you were that certain, then just put all your money into whatever your idea is and you'd own the world. Well, the problem is we could occasionally be wrong. Now, every now and then I feel like I feel really assured that I'm going to make money on a trade and I just know it's going to happen and everything plays out perfectly. And when I've said this before, people are like, well, Dave, why don't you just tell me that ahead of time? It's like, well, I would, but every now and then it doesn't work in spite of the setup being just absolutely beautiful. So I can't do that, okay? Now, the other thing you're going to do, number nine, is going to take partial profits when offered. Now, again, we hope to be in trades for a long, long time. By the way, you can only predict the short term when it comes to markets, but you can stick with the trend as long as it moves in your favor. And I forget, I've got a quote out there somewhere. I think uh, I said, I once said, you can only predict so far, but you could follow them forever when it comes to trends. So a lot of times you'll just end up with what I call the better than a poke in the eye trade. You'll get in, you'll get a little swing trade, everything feels pretty good, you'll bump your stop up, like, all right, I got something great here, bump your stop up and you scratch out. Sometimes that rinse and repeat happens quite often. So you don't know what's going to happen longer term, so you have to be willing to take those partial profits. And as I often say, a lot of times we'll get in trades and this will happen over and over again. Two or three or four times, sometimes maybe six or seven times in a row. And then people email me and say, hey Dave, why don't we just take 100%? Well, the reason you don't is because we're trying to capture these big longer term moves. And on the flip side, when the trades start looking like this, which is the ultimate goal, people like, hey, Dave, why are we bothering taking profits? Well, let's just ride these things out longer term. And the reason is you don't know if this is going to incur, occur. In fact, this is going to happen more often than these bigger trends. And I probably make it sound a little too elusive, but it is fairly elusive to capture those longer term trends. And again, we don't know. And we're trend followers, so we have to just follow along and stick with the market as long as it moves in our favor. Now, number 10, I will not take any unnecessary action, thereby micromanaging myself out of trades. Now, I guess before I get into micromanagement, let me just give you a, pre a brief definition because I'm sure somebody's going to ask, what's the difference between discretion and micromanagement? Well, discretion is making a small tweak to the system or the plan by, there, uh, by using your brain. For instance, we have one that we talked about for a couple of weeks here. We had a profit target of 33, and it got really close, came back in. Really close, came back in. And hopefully third time was the charm for some of the people I was telling, please take those profits in the service. Now, in the service, I track things mechanically to avoid confusion. But those people who are disciplined can apply a little discretion. So, again, this uh, discretion is just a small tweak. Micromanagement is abandoning the plan. And I have some... Uh, more official definitions of it out there if you go in and watch the, the prior week in charts or previous week in charts, I should say. But in a nutshell, or to sum it up, micromanagement is completely abandoning the plan in an attempt to outsmart the market. One is using your brain. One is trying to look smart or outsmart. Now, there's different types of micromanagement that occur, one of which is when you think Oh, you know what? That that stock's going far enough. So let's say stock's up 25%, and you're like, you know, I think that's enough. I think I'm going to go ahead and take profits on that because I can make a mortgage payment with that, or I could pay a credit card off with that, or whatever. Well, as I often say, it's sort of like quitting at the 50-yard line. If you quit when you're up 25%, you'll never make 50%. If you quit when you're up 50%, you never make 100%. 
and so on and so forth. And as I often say, but Dave, how much you make? How many times you make 100%? It's like, well, not that often, but when you do, it makes it all worthwhile. So one micromanagement obviously would be to mentally monetize those profits and say, oh, that's 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 real money there, and that real money, I could do this, I could do that, and you're going to be feel you're going to feel tempted to take that money and do those things. And if you do that, and that stock takes off without you, you're going to end up in a very bad state of regret. And that's a story for another, or that's a another lesson in and of itself. But those missed opportunities like that can really weigh heavily on you from a psychological standpoint. Another form of micromanagement is like, okay, well, the stock's going sideways. We've got a few stocks that are going sideways for months. So, well, Dave, you're a trend follower. Why don't you get out? Well, it hadn't hit the stop. Maybe it's just digested its gains, and maybe it's it's functioning now on a higher time frame, on a higher time level. Like a, maybe it's kind of like working its way out on a weekly chart, and it's building the mother of all bases. And the bigger the base, the bigger the move in the space, as you know. So you just have to sit tight. And not doing anything is harder than it sounds, but a lot of times that's the thing to do. And again, micromanagement is trying to outsmart the market. And you may try to outsmart the market in a variety of ways. One, you might say, you know, this stock is going against me and the market's going higher and it's going down. It's just not acting right. I, You know what? I'm going to get out the market. All trades will go against you at some point, okay? It might be sooner, it might be later, but all trades are going to get, go against you at some point. They're going to correct, and if you're in longer-term trend following mode, maybe you'll ride out that correction. If you're still in the swing trade mode, you hadn't made the transition over, then sometimes they'll trigger and just go against you for a while and then eventually take off. Well, if you get out before they eventually take off, obviously you'll never make any money on a trade. The perverse thing about micromanagement, and here's that market is a bad teacher speech that, that often rears its ugly head, but the perverse thing about micromanagement is more often than not, it works, okay? More often than not, you get up, get out when you're up 25%, and then the, then the gains evaporate, and you feel like a genius because you got out 25%. More often than not, stock's going against you. You decide you're going to get out because it's going against you, and then you save a few bucks on that stop by not waiting for that stop to get officially hit. But the one or two times when it doesn't work will make your year. And I, and I hate to say it, but it, as I wrote the column, I mean, it's a, it's a, let me see if I could summarize it without talking too much. Uh, as I often say, I, I, I shorted Dow once at $55 a share. I'm sorry, it was like $50 a share. And I said, you know what, I'm going to put a stop at 55 But I didn't put it in an actual stop. I had like a mental stop. And I kept checking the quotes. And back then I had to punch in the quotes on a uh, telephone. It was one of those automated uh, broker systems back before we had online back before the internet believe it or not and uh just so happened i was able to you know keep punching and keep punching those keys in all day long i guess my co-workers thought look at dave he's on the phone all day he's working his ass off uh and you know it's i got the quote it was 57 i'm sorry 54 and seven eights i'm like you know it's close enough to 55 so i got out of the trade and as i said i think a few weeks ago i told the story it's also in the column but i got my father to trade too and then uh, that turned out to be the high tick. And then Dell imploded over the next several months. And then I think when it got to like 18 or something, a report came out that said that they were cooking the books and then it went to the single digits. So that one trade that I micromanaged myself out could have made my whole year. And that was a very tough lesson. It was tough because I also had my father involved. And we'll talk about getting someone else involved in trading in a positive way in a few minutes. Now, Number 11 is you're going to seek excitement outside of the market. The market is a very expensive place to look for education. I'm sorry, not education. Entertainment <laughs> and excitement. It's a good place to look for education. But again, remember, the market could be a bad teacher. But as far as excitement and entertainment, look for excitement and entertainment outside of the market. If you want some excitement and entertainment, go to Vegas. At least at least while you're losing your money, a pretty girl will bring you a drink. Or, as I often say, beat the dead horse in this one, 
have an affair. That way you only lose half of your money. Now, as I often say, the, the easiest way to solve for this problem of looking for entertainment, excitement, is to just do something to keep yourself busy. Right now I'm doing a webinar, okay? And that's stopping me from, from watching every little tick on the charts. And I know myself, if I watch every little tick, I'm going to overtrade. I'm going to place the necessary trades. I'm going to be tempted to micromanage. But instead, I work on courses. I write. I do a lot of things to keep me busy. I travel the world, speak of the good word on trend following. I just do all these things because I know myself. So you're going to have to know yourself and know what you're prone to do. And if I'm not here in front of my screens, I'm off doing something. I have a bit of a sickness. It's funny. I mentioned this before and a few of you people have emailed. Me. It's like, hey, I got that too. I can't sit still. And I've done a few things over the last year or so to become a little healthier. Uh, not much, but a little. And, and that's made it even worse as far as me not being able to sit still. Even if, like if I'm at home, I have to pull a laptop up and start working if my wife is watching TV and I'm hanging out with her. And if I am sitting down watching a movie with her, doing nothing, so to speak, it's like I'm shaking a foot or doing something. So uh, I keep myself crazy busy. My wife calls me hobby boy. And I've gotten into all kinds of things over the year, years that are just keeping keep me extremely busy. I, I don't know what it is to be bored, and, and maybe if I if I became bored for a while, it would make me crazy. But I have to always be doing something. But that that obsessive personality, for lack of a better word for it, is is really dangerous in the trading world. So if I'm sitting here in front of these six screens, I'm going to be inclined to do something. So instead of keeping, uh, you know, I'll keep a loose eye on markets, okay. Because it's what I do. I mean, this is the business that, I, that I've chosen. And every now and then, there's a little action to be taken. But in the meantime, I keep myself very, very busy to stop me from doing those things. So there's physical things you could do. And as I often say, busy traders make good traders. And I'm kind of going back and forth with the client. We're joking back and forth. And I told them, say, hey, you know, thanks for all the fodder for your, uh, for your lessons. But... He's a doctor, and his trading has gotten a lot better lately. And it's not because he got smarter or had some epiphany or he's following an exact plan or some one of these things that are obvious. It's because one of his doctors quit who was taking care of things at night at the hospital for him, and now he's literally working day and night. He has no time to trade, and he's only taking the best opportunities. He's not trying to force things to happen. So that's a very simple thing to do is just keep yourself busy. Now, I believe that busy traders make good traders. They trade when an opportunity presents itself, then it, they go off to save lives, build buildings, defend people, train dogs, and repair automatic transmissions. And I think I probably do, I probably could do a better job on my website to promote things to the to the busy person with a real career as opposed to trying to uh, inadvertently promote myself to the trader folk okay so I, I think if you're going to be a good trader you need to keep yourself busy doing something okay and maybe it's research you know just do some research study IPOs go back and study markets historically put a moving average in the S&P 500 going back to, uh, or the Dow, I should say, going back to the 1900s, and just see what it happens. See what happens. Study the slope, study the daylight, throw a couple of moving averages in, study the proper order uh, of the moving averages. Just do something like that. Study price. Study, again, get back to the daylight. Study the, the bars above the moving average. See how long that, that, that keeps you in a trend. Do something like that to keep you busy as opposed to sitting there watching the screen where you're going to be inclined to take action and overtrade. So number 12 is going to be accept what the market is willing to give. And again, this is where the real world and the trading world, two different worlds, and we're not wired to trade, especially the motivated and educated simply aren't made to trade. 
and you didn't get to where you are in your current or prior career by not having control of the situation. And the problem is it's very difficult. In fact, it's impossible to control the situation when it comes to trading. You can only control yourself. And that can be tough. And along the lines of control, every trade, as I said earlier, will likely go against you. And then every trade, I should say, every trade will go against you at some point. Every trade will end badly. And you can't control that. Trying to control that will push you into that micromanagement camp, which we kind of beat the dead horse on that already, too. I guess I kind of beat the dead horse on saying beat the dead horse. <laughs> but control is a tough one for a lot of people. And this is where the serenity prayer, the so-called serenity prayer, prayer comes to life. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And trust me, in markets you have no control. You can only control your reaction. You can only do specific things to mitigate damage. And then you could do also do specific things to ride out longer-term trends. Now, on every trade, you need to do an honest post-mortem. And for me, the post-mortem, my epiphany over the years has been when I do that post-mortem, especially if I'm if I'm not doing it like right after a trade, if I'm looking at it a few months down the road, looking at my records and then going through those trades to see what's going on. And through the process, my epiphany over the years has been, what the hell was I thinking? And it obviously wasn't intuition that got me into the trade, quoting a line from Market Wizards. It was into wishing, okay? Into wishing, some sort of trying to make something happen. As opposed to waiting for the best setups. Now, I have found in more recent years, I no longer find myself saying that, at least not nearly as much. Okay, Every now and then I'm like, eh, that probably wasn't the greatest thing in the world. But that doesn't happen very often. And I'll tell you one thing that has kept that from happening, and I'm just kind of thinking about this as I'm talking here. But one thing that has, that has kept that from happening is putting myself in, in the position of, okay, let's imagine I was looking at this stock a month from now or two months from now or three months from now doing that post-mortem. Would I tell myself, what the hell were you thinking? Now, hopefully that made sense, and that's a little bit, I'm kind of backing into the concept of delivered practice, and that's what I'm trying to point out, is that before you even get into the trade, think about what or how you would feel if you were looking at that trade in complete hindsight. And hopefully that makes sense, but that's been a really big epiphany for me, and that's really helped me out tremendously by looking at the trade and saying, okay, I like this trade, but how would I feel two months from now, three months from now, if I was looking back at it? Was it was it really that great? And hopefully that makes sense to you. To me, that makes a lot of sense to me. But if it doesn't, uh, shoot me an email. Maybe we could we could flesh it out a little bit more. And when you're doing that post mortem, you have to realize a couple things that outcomes are noisy. And that's another quote. i got to look that one up. I don't know if I mentioned that already. But outcomes are noisy. Sometimes you can do everything right in trading and still lose money. And that can be tough. Sometimes you can overtrade and make money. Sometimes you can not honor your stop and the stock turns around and you make a lot of money. That doesn't mean that you did the right thing. Longer term, you're going to get in a lot of trouble with that bad behavior. But a post-mortem is very, very important. And you've got to be honest. And it's tough being honest. 
And the problem with this business is the only part, you have to be accountable to yourself. So through that post-mortem, you need to reward yourself for following the proper process. And process is the key word in that sentence. It is a process, and it is a process that you have to follow. And you have to reward yourself for following that process. So again, outcomes are noisy, and the market could be a really bad teacher. Again, if you don't honor that stop and the market turns around, you feel pretty smart because you toughed it out. If you micromanage yourself out, and then the market drops like a stone, you feel pretty smart because you mitigated those losses. If you took profits at 25% and the stock implodes the day after and goes down 50% or 100%, you feel pretty smart because you're locking those profits. But remember that market is often a bad teacher and outcomes are no noisy. And by the way, if the market was not a bad teacher, then it wouldn't exist because people wouldn't be out there doing certain things. And you wouldn't be able to read the psychology of the market through technical analysis. So it's a good thing that people are doing all these bad behaviors. You just can't do them if you want to make money off of them. And human nature never changes. And that's why I think technical analysis will always work. Now, getting back to holding yourself accountable, number 15 is you do have to hold yourself accountable. You're the only one. The great thing is you have all the control. It's not like you're in some job and somebody's micromanaging you and won't let you do what you need to do to for the good of the company or whatever. You do what has to be done in trading. You're in charge of your destiny, but, you know, heavy is the head that uh, wears a crown, right? Um, one thing I would recommend you do is be willing to get someone else involved with your trading. I'm sure it's going to be a dead horse story. You know, I guess i got to quit saying the dead horse thing, right? <laughs> but a client understands my stuff and he does very well for a while and then he starts over trading and does all his other crazy stuff day trading over trading um getting into less than ideal setups it's like it he does it this tends to happen two times one after he's doing really well and two after he's doing really crappy um so i guess in one case it goes to his head when he's doing really well in another case, it's like he just sort of uh, takes on this gambling persona when it comes to the markets to try to um, get the money back. And maybe it's through trading a small account, running it down too much, feeling like, okay, well, I might as well just gamble away the rest of this. I don't know the exact cause of these things, but I said, hey, here's the deal. Does your wife know anything about your trading? And he's like, no. I said, would you be willing to get her involved? And he said, no, that would end the marriage. So I don't want you to end your marriage by getting your wife involved with your trading. And by the way, you ladies out there, remember the study showed that husbands who got their wives involved, the trading got better for their husbands. But wives who got their husbands involved, the trading got worse. And that's where I think the ego trumps emotions as far as pitfalls of trading. So be willing to get someone involved. When I was in Germany last, was that last fall? When was that? Oh, geez, that was over a year ago, a year and a half ago. There were two guys there. One guy was an ex-world poker champion, and he was a successful trader. And his good friend was also trading, and, and he wasn't so successful. He was micromanaging himself by the trades and doing a lot of these bad behaviors we talked about. But they both had the same philosophy and mentality at, towards the markets. So I'm willing to bet if that the guy who was struggling with it really wanted to get better, he would just hold himself more accountable and follow along. 
and maybe tell the other guy, you know, say, okay, go ahead and give me the tough love if I need it. But being able to see someone actually do it tells you or proves to you that you can actually do it. And then he could do a postmortem and say, okay, well, Joe over here followed the system and Joe's up 100% and I'm down 30%. I know what I did wrong. I just have to do it. And sometimes it's not easy. So maybe consider getting someone else involved in your trading. Maybe teach someone what you're doing, get them involved, and then when you're not following the plan, they'll ask you, why aren't you following the plan? And I have the luxury of having the educational business, which I can't teach one thing and do something else. I can't teach consistency and then be inconsistent. It forces me, and sometimes it's painful, it forces me to put out that plan where there is a stop in place and we can't just wing it hoping that things will turn around. Now this is something I also talk about or often is you're going to embrace your emotions in 2017 and one thing to do is be cognizant of what's going on. I've already dropped an F-bomb this morning or two maybe and things are actually going pretty well for me today. Uh, not not on every position, otherwise I wouldn't have dropped the F-bomb. But you need to be cognizant of your emotions, especially in trading, but also be cognizant of your emotions in life. And that's going to help you to recognize how emotional of creatures we are. I'm, I'm so emotional. I cry like a schoolgirl during a Nicholas Sparks, uh, <laughs> if I'm forced to watch a Nicholas Sparks movie, you know. Uh, so I know I'm emotional, big, huge dude that's emotional. It's kind of uh, funny. But embrace those emotions, recognize those emotions, not just in trading but in life. And you have to realize with every decision is going to come emotion. And, again, this is a research of Scholl and Damasio, which I talk about quite often. I notice uh, Denise Scholl is going to be in uh, New York. I'll have to, um, I'll have to uh, pop into her um, – her seminar of time allows uh, during Traders Expo. Uh, by the way, I'm doing Traders Expo in February. Keep an eye out for a banner ad on my website or look at the email for this uh, Today's Week of Charts. Uh, come meet me there if you get a chance. But uh, Denise Shaw talked about the fact that with every decision, you're going to have emotions, and I added, I added stress to that too. And you can't function as a human being without some sort of emotions. Whatever decision you make has a consequence. And with that consequence has emotions and stress. So you just have to wrap, around, wrap your head around that and know, again, going in, that the trade eventually is going to end badly and figure out how you're going to deal with that. Now, number 17 is you're going to go to my website. You're going to print off the article, which this material came from, and you're going to refer to it often in 2017. All right, lots of uh, questions coming in. Let me just get through uh, some announcements, and we'll get to the questions. Um, one thing I thought about a couple weeks ago is even when things are good, it's still tough. I mean, I'm having a good day today, but it's still tough because not everything is working, okay? And even if everything was, sometimes – you're going to have some down days and some down moments and some down hours. So that's one thing to wrap your head around. And I often talk about the being in a state of regret. And one thing I've been watching, and I'd, I'd like to plot it out. I wish there was enough time to plot it out. But in my mind's eye, I've been plotting it out. And I've been looking at trades that I've taken recently. And they'll trigger... Looks something like this. Let's see. This is my. This is where I get in. Okay, and let me do it from the upside. I was thinking of a, of a specific short of the currency, but it'd be easier to do it on the upside. But let's say you get in here, and then this is just going to measure your P and L. A lot of times, it might look like this, where you just spend a little bit of time. 
and profitability, or prof, profitable, I should say. So you end up being kind of bobbed out. This could be days, weeks, months, depends on how you're plotting it or your time frame. And then, not all the time, but lo and behold, the trade begins to take off, and then your, your profits look like this, okay? But you might have to sit a long time for that to happen. Your timing might be good because you're following the system, but the market doesn't necessarily always care about your time frame. So I think it'd be kind of a, a good exercise if you're looking for some homework to make a little plot uh, that would show your profitability as a, um, I guess like a bar chart, and to see how much time you spend unprofitable. And then the other thing, which I think it was Robert Frey did, talked about the time, talked about how 75% of the time you're in a state of regret because you're giving up profits. And if you think about it, markets tend to move in small chunks, and then the rest of the time, they're digesting their gains. So you might just sit there, sit there, sit there, sit there, sit there, then bam, you make a lot of money. If you micromanage yourself out of that so-called dead trade or dead money, you're never going to make a lot of money. So even when things are good, it's still tough. Patience, obviously, is key. And again, remain cognizant of your emotions. And you want to trade like someone is watching. A couple announcements. Um, I've begun rolling out a learning management system. And this might not be such an easy feat. But I hope to have it up and running over the next few months, or at least within 2017. Um, so much of my time is spent answering questions and saying, uh, go in and watch the videos on trailing stops and go in and watch the uh, columns that I did on trailing stops. And it's like, where are those columns? And I got to go find them and all this. So I'm hoping that through a learning management system, we'll be able to get all this stuff organized and rolled out. And it might be a, um, there might be a nominal cost for all this, but I'm going to, I'm kind of noodling with that. And specifically in the courses, it's going to be really good because you're going to have a, uh, you could have be forced to take people that buy courses, and it's okay to email. I mean, that's fine. But I get a lot of questions on stuff that is very obviously in the course. And it makes me wonder if the person's actually watching the course. Well, we're going to fix all that, hopefully, in 2017. I know there's going to be a little – I know it's not going to be perfect, but I think it's going to, it's going to really be a lot better than it was. And uh, that the first course I'm going to roll out with this is going to be the beginner's course. And you'll see more about that really soon. Uh, also, again, make sure you're on a delayed service at the least. And as I said last few weeks, um, I do. there is a limit to the amount of people I can keep on the service on a delayed basis because there is a cost involved. And if you've been on delayed for over a year and you still don't know whether the service is for you or not, maybe trading is not for you because good traders make quick decisions. Now, if you can't afford to be on the service and you just want to keep following along, shoot me an email, and I'll make room for you on that. So no problem. Okay? All right. Uh, let's get to some of these questions, and then we'll open it up for – if you want to start asking about stocks, individual stocks, feel free to do that uh, right now. Thank you, Larry. All right, we'll get to that at Howard. Screens to go smartphones. Don't know what that means. Intuition or intuition? Yes. And it's I-N-T-O-W-I-S-H-I-N-G. Two words. I use the genius prayer. God grant me the courage to change the things I cannot accept. Serenity to accept the things I have changed. And the wisdom to know I'm different. <laughs> So that could be my uh, problem. Craig, That's that needs to go in a column. That's awesome. Thank you, man. I appreciate you sharing that. Craig's a dog trainer. So if you guys have any dogs that need training, that needs training. Craig told me once that he doesn't train dogs. He trains people. And he said that dogs all, for the most part, have a certain characteristics. I mean, you're not going to get one with two heads or or 10 legs or whatever. There's a certain way dogs act and behave, and I don't want to get myself in too much trouble because I don't know that much about dogs, although I have a couple. 
one of which I'm waiting to get, trying to get them rolled over. <laughs> That's another story. So I stole that, Dave. Have to give credit. Okay, gotcha. Uh, but yeah, you know, Craig said he's training the the person because the dogs are are mostly the same. There's a little difference in the personality of the dogs, but he's training the people. He's not training the dogs. Okay. And that's the, the common denominator uh, for the problem is the person. So, I mean, in trading, there's certain ways markets work as a general statement. And obviously, they don't always do that. If they did, then we'd all, whoever knew the secret of that, which it is the secret, by the way, would own the world. So, it's, it's not the market, it's you, is what I think I'm trying to get to. Okay, Jill says, HOV downgraded. Those bastards. What's your opinion on the theory stocks will be downgraded because the big boys want to buy and they manipulate the market with a downgrade, thus entering on a price drop? Well, you have to be really careful when you start thinking about market manipulation. because that can change your mindset. As I've said before, I had this guy kept emailing me and emailing me and emailing me. He was getting stopped out repeatedly in Forex trades. And he kept, he was sure the market was being manipulated. And when the emails got to about three or four pages, which I don't have that much time to read, okay? Not that I'm being rude, I just don't have that much, I literally don't have that much time. Um, but he was obviously obsessing over this. And is the market manipulated? Probably. Okay. Somebody once said, uh, markets don't move, markets are moved. So you have to be willing to accept the fact that markets are probably manipulated. And if they are, how can you use that manipulation to your advantage? Now, it sucks if you're in a trade and the market gets manipulated. But let's say in the case of HOV, which we'll take a look at the chart in a minute, or any stock, whatever. Let's just say a stock in general. And somebody comes out with a downgrade, and that stock's in trending like no tomorrow. Well, use this opportunity. This could be a TKO, right? Use this opportunity to your advantage and then get in with the big boys, okay? We know I don't trade opening gap reversals as like a, a day trading thing, but every now and then I'll use the concept of opening gap reversals to help me out. So you know that let's say a market's dropping and you're in a damage control situation and all of a sudden that stock implodes overnight you know that stock is being manipulated further lower than it really should be, okay? The real reaction should have been about right here, but all of a sudden stock opens down here. So you know it's an overreaction. And that overreaction is due to some sort of manipulation, right? Because how many times does it just turn around and go right back up? So what you do is you use that manipulation to your advantage. So in the case of uh, the methodology in general, that manipulation could cause a TKO type of move then enter above that high when that occurs, and then you're on the same size of manipulation. But I hear you. It's, it's, it happens, you know, and, and it's hard not to get upset about it. Uh, I cuss and fuss, okay? A useful tool I use is TradeBench Trading Journal, tradebench.com, and the best part, it's free. All right, Joe, we'll give them a little plug. But yeah, absolutely do some sort of a... You know, one thing good about Telechart, and I don't do it because it's too much, uh, my charts would be too messy, uh, but I'm doing it in other programs, and it's kind of helping me out, and it's one thing I've been doing more and more of lately, is uh, just putting some labels and notes on the actual chart. And at TC, you could also uh, attach a note to each uh, chart. Uh, by the way, if you are thinking about getting Telechart, um, if you go to my Getting Started on my website, I have a banner ad there, so go through me. Um, it won't, I don't get paid much, but I'll get like a, a, a token compensation and I can take that and, uh,
toss under the plate or or put it towards a website uh, storage or something like that. So or the go to webinar bill, whatever. But uh, do that. It, it does help things. Uh, every little bit helps as far as keeping the educational business up and running. Um, but yeah, any anything that you could find, any tool you could find that helps you out. And, and for in 2017, you know, we're all trying to uh, get a little better at what we do, get a little more organized and all, New Year's resolutions and all. Uh, I've learned that small steps is the way to go, and that's based on um, Dr. Robert Mara's book uh, talking about the Kaizen, the Kaizen way. I think that's the right. I think that's it. If not, um, if you Google Dr. Robert Mara, uh, it's a good book to read. And I was talking with a couple of you guys about that recently. In fact, I did a webinar not long ago where that was a big part of the webinar. But a small change like just me putting some notes on some of these charts. So when I pull the charts up, it reminds me of what needs to be done. I think that's a very little uh, little tip that you could do. Jack says, great book, Kaizen, K-I-K-A-I-S-E-N. Yeah, it's a good book. It's a little read. I mean, you could, you could read it in one sitting. It's, it's a great little book, okay? If they manipulate down, then buy when they... Well, yeah, I mean, manipulate down, buy, you know, you don't want to buy, you don't know that they're actually manipulating, okay? You suspect it, you smell a rat, okay? But what you do is you continue to follow your plan and realize that that market manipulation is actually helping you, unless, of course, you're already long and it knocks you out of the trade. But you can't say, oh, those bastards are manipulating this stock, they stopped me out. I, I, you know what? I'm hanging on. Okay? No, 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 no. That's that's not how that works. But if you see a stock that kind of smells like a rat, you know, and you have that knockout move, then look to get long above the high as you would trade a normal trend knockout. Okay, Jill says, as someone who trains my own dogs for competition. Ah, well, Jill, you and Craig should, uh, should get together and uh, compare some notes sometime. Uh, Craig is so right about training people, not the dogs, and repetition is key. Okay. Yeah, maybe you two guys can trade some notes. I'll be happy to uh, uh, share your information if you want to do that. Does he have a dog in the race? <laughs> Leon says, excellent chart show, Dave. One of your best. Yeah, many things. Oh, thank you, Leon. Yeah, my problem is when I do these things, if, as my wife always asks me, he's like, how'd it go? I'm like, eh, I went blah, 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 blah. I rambled a lot, rambled a lot, but I don't know. I think I brought it all together at some point, and that's every show. And somebody actually emailed me and said, Dave, you, you're hinting that you're going to stop uh, rambling. No, that's when we learn the most. <laughs> you do a poor job trying to tell us things, and then you ramble off, and then, hey, I actually pick up a few things. All right, let's hop into the charts. Keep the questions coming. And uh, let me know if there's uh, indivi any individual issues you want to take a look at. Uh, while uh, I'm waiting for those to come in, let's take a look at the overall market and flesh out. Let's take a look at the Hobbit area, HLV. Yeah, this, see, this is the one that got whacked this morning. Um, and you can see it's off its worst levels now. Um, let's see, where's the spreadsheet on this? <clears throat> Let's see what we got. Where'd it go? All right, we'll come back to that. Okay, let's take a look at the, uh, we'll come back to that one. Let's take a look at the overall market and then let's uh, take a look at a few sectors. And then we'll start jumping into individual stocks. I won't spend a whole lot of time on this because there's not a tremendous amount that needs to be said that I haven't said recently. Let's take a look at the piece. Getting whacked a little bit today, but hey, you know what? That's no big deal. So far, we're still hanging out in this range. And as long as it hangs out in a range, the better. Uh, one thing I would I keep an eye out for is sometimes when you have a base, you have a little fake out move below the base, and that just shakes out some people and allows the market to trade higher. So we did see that a little bit uh, end of last year, and then maybe now we're going to come down and test the base to do a little knockout. Again, um, I'm often quoting Linda Rasky, the market will do the obvious in an unobvious manner. 
And the corollary is that it will often do what has to do to frustrate the most. And that's what might be going on right now. Uh, does, does the obvious and unobvious manner, uh, breaks out, looks like it's off of the race, and then bam, has a big knockout. This is obviously the NASDAQ. Uh, Howard says, hey, Dave, it's back. The big WRB to the downside of the NASDAQ, possibly the first one of the year. And all is not lost as the Reverend has returned. All right. I think that's a compliment hidden in there somewhere. But, yeah, this is not that – this is – I wouldn't even call that a wide-range bar, okay? Uh, it's down, what, 0.87? You know, this looks like a wide-range bar back here, uh, two of them, in fact. Uh, that is uh, 1.36. You know, anything less than a percent given the current – uh, volatility and height of the NASDAQ is not a wide range bar. This is a wide range bar right back here, okay? So I wouldn't get too excited about that just yet, but that does have a little bit of a knockout type of characteristic to it. And notice that we're off the worst level so far today, but so far so good. Don't argue with the market when it's just off of new highs, okay? Now, Russell 2000 getting whacked a little bit today, beginning to recover a little bit. Now, hopefully, and I know I just said the word hope, but hopefully, this is one of those shakeout fakeouts below the base to where everybody's like, aha, it's breaking down. Let's short with both fists. I'm going to bail out on all my longs. Oh, geez. You know, as we say in Fargo, oh, geez. Markets we get to take. Let's just all bail out. And then that clears away, shakes out the nervous delis and clears away from the market to trade higher. Uh, longer term, Russell still looks pretty good. Uh, but, yeah, it's losing some steam in here. So let's pay attention to what's going on. Your moving averages are beginning to squeeze down a little bit, come together. So if we do get a crossing in these, uh, that would be another signal. Uh, don't necessarily wait for it to cross. So if it starts dropping like a stone, then uh, we might have to get out the way. And how do we get out of the way? Well, we let the stops take us out. Electronic discount bro brokerages have made fortunes eliminating the need to get someone else involved in your trading. Well, you know, I will tell you this, um, and I've said this before too, back um, when I used to have to call in my futures orders uh, in my CTA days, and the, the, people, the people taking orders were just order takers, okay? But if you take orders all day long, you begin to understand how markets begin to work. And I'll never forget one day I called in, and I forget what commodity it was, but... Um, it might have been corn. I forget. I can't remember. But what I did was I called in and said uh, I was long, and it was, the market was going against me. So what I did was I called in, and I had them move the stop lower, which you're not supposed to move a stop lower. You're just supposed to let the stop get taken out. She's like, let me get this right. You want to lower your stop? You know, it's like – so it, it back then, and we're missing that aspect of it. And then after that, I had a, a very good futures broker who actually – uh, he had a small firm, but he actually worked with some of the market wizards, at, at, uh, or one in particular, years ago. Uh, very smart gentleman, and he actually would help me in my trade. So, and and uh, so it's it's good to have that other person involved, and that has been eliminated, obviously, through the discount brokers on that level. So, what you'll have to do now is find someone who's willing to look over your shoulder. OK, or just follow along my service and that every time you don't follow the plan, tell me, hey, David, didn't follow the plan. And then I'll tell you, don't do that. OK. Um, in general, sectors are looking pretty good today, notwithstanding. Chemicals just hit new highs yesterday. Energies uh, were coming back nicely uh, today, notwithstanding. Now they're just kind of consolidating in here. Metals and mining actually uh, open a gap reversal here. But they're up towards uh, multi-year highs, so they're looking pretty good. And, you know, getting back to that market doing the obvious, it sure looked like the metals and mining were rolling over recently. In fact, the moving averages look back here. It looked like it was, we're going to have a bow tie down. It started to look kind of ugly. Okay? And then what happened? It turned around and went right back up. Now I'm not saying be I'm not saying be obstinate, but if you're long a metals and mining as we are now, we are, we've got a couple of the portfolio, then just honor your stops just in case, okay? But don't bail out just because the sector starts looking a little dubious, because it might just be a correction or some sort of shakeout. Not a big fan of gold and silver. I know golds are starting, the stocks are starting to make bow ties. I'd rather a bow tie off of low levels like this 
as opposed to fairly mid-level. So this is the stocks themselves. Uh, silver, same sort of action, short to turn back up. I'm not really inclined to rush out and take a bunch of setups. I'd much rather like coming off of all-time lows like this than these mid-levels, okay? But if we start seeing some decent setups, we'll take them on a setup-by-setup -setup basis, or evaluate them, I should say. Um, food's not doing so well. I'm not a big fan of trading the foods, but uh, banks doing okay. Not the most exciting area in the world, but still doing okay. Today, notwithstanding, you see we're up here towards the new highs. One thing I've been preaching lately is we will have to pay careful attention to sector rotation in 2017. Uh, as long as a sector remains at or near new highs, no need to take any action, okay? But if the sector does begin to roll over, you need to think about possibly shorting some stocks within the sector, provided they're set up, or sitting on your hands of that sector until it goes on, unless, until or unless it turns around and goes on to make new highs. A couple of areas not looking so great here. Drugs got whacked yesterday. Um, the Jerry and I think put out a post on Facebook I saw, or actually Marcy read it to me. She was in the house uh, looking at her uh, phone, and she said, the Jerry just said, hey, you know, market dropped on Trump's speech. We were watching Trump's speech. And, uh, he was talking about biotech and drugs got whacked, and that's what the, it was blamed on. Um, who knows, and who cares as far as I'm concerned. But you can see biotech's actually coming back a little bit today, so be careful those big picture ideas because who knows what's going to happen. Just follow along, okay? Uh, some of the technology areas today notwithstanding doing okay in here, such as the SIBIs. In fact, this is just kind of like a little trend pivot pullback looking type of pattern. So, so far, so good there. So overall, things look okay. But you know the routine. Take things one day at a time. Stop if you heard that before. Uh, I do find it interesting that bonds are beginning to carve out a bottom in here. Uh, we've been talking about their slowing in their descent for a while. But, Dave, why don't you buy them? Well, I said, as I said back over the last month or two, it looks like they're trying to slow down going lower. So it's not going to be this complete route like we saw back in November. Uh, they're bottoming. It's a process. We don't want to rush in and buy them. But let them bottom. As a trend follower, that's what you do. Okay. All right, Andre, uh, that is our, that's, oh, yeah, we could talk about that one, I guess. I forgot that it triggered yesterday. You should tell all your peeps have a method to interact, dialogue with each other, or is that crazy? Well, that's one of the things I'm actually thinking about, Andre, for uh, next year, is that in addition to get the learning management system rolled out, uh, get all the stuff organized, all the courses, free stuff, such as a lot, all the columns and courses and, and archives and all. Get them organized to where uh, it make them actually lessons. And then on top of that, have a, have a group to where you guys can interact with each other. And, and there would be a nominal charge for that because it would be, a, there'd be some cost on this and to roll it all out. But I do think that that could be a very good thing, and it would be so nominal, I think it would it would more than pay for itself. I mean, everything I do, I believe that it's it's more value. It's a, what's the, uh, the, there's a book called Science of Getting Rich, and I forget the exact quote, but you know, provide more in use value than you take in monetary value, and you'll become rich. And I, I believe that. I think that's true. So um, if, you could, if you could make more money than you give me, off of the information that I'm giving you, then my work is done, okay? Yeah, uh, Kim triggered yesterday. There's a couple of people, oh, how do you guys know that? Okay, Kim, here we go, yeah. Yeah, so this one actually triggered yesterday, uh, late in the day. This was a TKO type of move. Remember we talked about the TKO a second ago? It looks a little better when you look at it like this, okay? So you had this nice tread higher, and then bam, nice little TKO move. Watch that video on the website. You have to dig a little bit for it. Well, it's actually, uh, it's not too far into the website. Let me show you where it would be. If you go to the website, yeah, keep the stock picks coming. But yeah, I think it still looks, uh, it still looks kind of interesting in here. Um, you know, ideally, I mean, now you just follow the plan. It's not it's not a perfect setup anymore, but it was uh, a few days back. Um, if you go to my website, I'll show you where it, where it is. 
and you go down to uh, right here. See where it says more posts? This is the article you want to print off. Now, of course, you might be watching this a year from now, but if you go to more posts, and then once the everything's rolled out, it'll be a little bit uh, different layout here. But it's uh, called the best powder to get aboard existing treads, and that's the uh, TKO video. So I would strongly urge you to watch that. It's free. No, that's not true. No. Now, Kim's saying, uh, or, I'm sorry, Jill's, Jill's saying about Kim, I had a blast watching all the orders of T and S on Kim when the entry trigger hit. Boy, you have a lot of followers. No, no, Kim. Uh, I'm sorry, Jill. Jill, if you watch the time and sales on most of the stocks I recommend, it will bore you to death. Bore you to death. That I can promise you. And that tells me that people aren't following. People are getting it early or they're not taking the orders, okay, they're not taking the setup. So uh, in that case, it, it, I, I doubt seriously. I don't want to pat my ego and think I'm, I'm, that that many people follow me. No, that, I doubt that seriously. I think that's just an aberration. Craig says, I trail train judge border collies and stock dog trails. Yeah, those border collies, you got to work those dogs. Otherwise, they're a pain in the ass, right? Cool dogs. Rick wants to talk about edit. Edit's something I've been liking uh, for quite a while. It's, it's kind of what I call a, a non-specific pattern. Years ago, we called them traders' calls. They didn't necessarily fit the methodology, but they look interesting. We actually had this as a buy setup not long ago. I'm trying to think when. But it's one of those stocks where... It's kind of hard for me to explain. It just looks like a big bottom. It doesn't necessarily fit uh, precisely into one of my patterns. It just looks like a bottom. You know, maybe you could argue, well, it was a TK, it was a, I'm sorry, a, a bow tie back here. But it just looks like it's bottoming out. It's a fairly new stock. Uh, in other words, an IPO. It's still sort of an IPO, what I call a toddler. Uh, keep it on your radar. I think it's worth watching. Uh, I let it Maybe let it break out and play the first pullback. But absolutely, I've been watching that one for quite a while. Yeah, Shiva, the uh, the uh, URRE, I've been watching these uraniums. They're just kind of crazy. They're just too crazy. I mean, HB is 156. Um, you know, we'll see. Never say never. But let's see what happens on a pullback on URRE. A uh, little... Uh, Little bottle rocket looking, but longer term, I hear, longer term, it's a ma could be a major bottom in these uraniums. Um, we had a good run in uraniums and rare metals a while back. Maybe that is coming back. So uh, I could never say it. Molybdenum. Maybe look at the stocks that in those rare metals uh, might be worth a shot. Been long for a while. OCN. What does today mean? Well, it means somebody selling it. That's all it means. Okay. There's more. Today means there's more supply than there is demand. There's not more sellers than there are buyers, okay, because the buyers and sellers are matched, right? But there's more supply than there is demand. There are people willing to sell it lower. And and this is something that I, that I went into a lot of detail in, in that intro course, which I think is going to be really cool explaining supply and demand, not more buyers than sellers. And supply and demand just simply means that if you want to sell this stock for somebody to buy it from you, you're going to have to be willing to drop what you're selling the stock for to get out, okay? But I wouldn't get too excited about uh, today's action. If you're in longer-term trend following mode, you have a stop in place. Don't get too excited about that. Let's take a look at like a two-day chart, three-day, nope. Uh, longer term, though, you can see it's kind of interesting. Not that it always shakes out like this, but look what's happening longer term. Look at the overhead supply that it's bumping up against, okay? So you can't say for a fact that's why it's stalling where it is, but it is kind of interesting. It is stalling in a textbook sort of manner, okay? So, but don't get too excited. Molly be damned. <laughs> Poor, uh, per an old James Gardner movie, support your local sheriff or gunfighter. Molly be damned. That's what I'll start calling it so it doesn't sound like I'm butchering it. 
Dave, let's look at a little, take a look at S and D. That's what I've been watching. Um, it's in a nice persistent trend. Remember, we talked about this one having a uh, an IPO breakout back here. Okay, uh, but yeah, on a pullback, absolutely. Put that on your uh, watch list for sure. Good eye on that. Uh, Shiv, Shiv is on the. Uh, I, hope, I hope I'm saying your name right. Shiv is new to service and. He's really sponging everything up. I'm kind of excited about, excited for him. IRTC. Um, no, this is a little, uh, so far, this is kind of wide and loose, okay? It is an IPO, but what I would do here is wait for this thing to break out to new highs, okay? And then look to um, to play pullbacks along the way. Uh, Rick says, CNX, hey, Dave, would you enter this stock if, in fact, you would? We're long that one, I think, or we were long that one. Let's see, C E N X. This is something I don't know. Um, no, we were long that earlier this year. Uh, no, let it break out to new highs. Okay, I think we were long back here somewhere on the bow tie or whatever. Let it break out to new highs, and if it keeps breaking out, uh, then look to play a pullback along the way. Okay. But yeah, put it on your watch list. Now it's starting to make new highs. Jerry wants to know about I C H R I C H R. Uh, yeah, this could work out nicely. This is another one of those little IPO breakout patterns. Uh, I'd like to see a little, tiny bit more knockout move on that one, though. But it looks good. It looks pretty good. You're you could do okay. Uh, no, Shiva wants to know about the same one. Same thing. Yeah, same thing on that one. Um, with IPOs, I'm not a huge breakout player, but I do play some breakout characteristics when it comes to IPOs. Okay. Phil says CENX was last year, LOL. Well, it's all a blur to me. <laughs> you know, it really is. Yeah, Kim, Kim triggered yesterday. That's true. KNSL, deep pull, but too deep and pullback and too thin. All right, let's see if Brett's answering his own questions. Uh, I don't think it's too deep of a pullback. Um, and, yeah, it's too thin, though. It is too thin. Yeah, that's really thin uh, stock here. Um, but it is a recent issue. I think it looks good, uh, but it's it's really thin. I mean, be really careful if you trade it uh, because, yeah, it's thin. But, no, the pullback's not too deep based on the magnitude of the move. It had a pretty decent move in here. So that actually looks okay. FRBK? Um. One thing that's kind of jumping out at me here is it is the move. You want to see stocks do like this, and then you want to see them accelerate higher. In this particular case, your acceleration higher was just really this one big bar up. I guess you can count this bar too. And then it sort of did this. So this stock did this, it did this, and then it kind of went that way a little bit. Uh, and now it looks like a little bit more than a pullback. So I think I would leave it alone because most of that – that big up move was just these two days here, and there was no acceleration. In general, you want to see it accelerate higher like I have mapped out over here. All right, we have a lot to catch up on. Salt. I'll try to do a lightning round. Uh, no, do keep an eye on the shippers. Uh, if it breaks out, then maybe on a pullback. But right now, it's kind of range bound. But the shippers are waking up again. I guess everybody got, ex got all excited with that dry ship thing, QTNA. Q, T, and A. Uh, yeah, that looks pretty good. Uh, definitely want to watch that one. Yeah, that looks fantastic. Uh, the pullback's a little too far, but it's still an IPO, so I would give it a pass based on that. But, yeah, that looks fantastic. I like it. High five on that one. Are you sure it's not a pullback in yields? Oh, I don't know. I mean, that's why I'm, there's no need to... There's no need to, to rush out to be a hero or anything. I mean, yeah, it's, I, I'm not saying it's a bottom there. It's still in a downtrend, but it's beginning to carve out a bottom. Yeah, I mean, who knows? Uh, I think bonds are headed ultimately headed higher, but it looks like we might be getting a pass for now. That's all I'm saying. That's why I'm saying don't rush out and buy them. OR? Yeah, that looks good. This is uh, But it's bottoming, okay? I wouldn't rush out and buy it just yet. A uh, little bit on the thin side, so be careful there. It's probably also a bow tie. Yeah, you got a bow tie. So wait for your next little knockout type of move, your next little pullback. And just, again, with the caveat that it is a little bit on the thin side. 
Um, and that's what we talked about earlier that uh, the um, we'll take the goal setups on a setup by setup basis, and not necessarily we're not necessarily trading the whole sector in and of itself. Yeah, this looks good. Whoever pointed this out, but uh, wait for a pullback. Ideally, I'd almost like to see a little bit acceleration in a pullback because if it pulls back, if it pulls back too much, then you're back to this prior breakout on here. So, Jim, good eye, but uh, let it let it see if it'll follow through. A K A O. Okay, AO, we're almost out of time. Now, it's another one of those, those stocks where it's just one one or two days where it shot higher. So I would leave that alone. It's And look at the HV, two, 217, too crazy. Uh, PK, would this be IPO breakout if it broke above 30? Well, the IPO breakout pattern, what we're, what we're, what we're looking for now with it is we're looking for uh, IPOs that are generally lower than $20 a share for that particular pattern that you're talking about. Um, it does seem to work in higher price issues. It just seems to work better in, in IPOs that come public below 30. So what I would do with this one is I think I would leave it alone and then uh, see how it shakes out. If it comes way down here and bottoms out for a while and then begins to take off bow tie, first thrust or something to go after it. Or conversely, if it does break out to new highs, just let it go and play pullbacks along the way. So treat it a little bit more like you would just a regular type of stock, regular generic stock, T-R-H-C. Um, yeah, see if this one continues to follow through. Right now, it actually have to make new highs and possibly pull back. But I hear what you're saying. It's it's that IPO pattern where you're near that new closing high. And so, yeah, it's, it's okay. I mean, you can certainly do a lot worse. But, yeah, not bad. TGB. I actually have a position on this one. Um, uh, full disclosure on that. Uh, this is stock. This is outside of the service. This is something that I pointed out in the service, but it was just a little too volatile for the overall service. Uh, wait for pullbacks, and hopefully we don't have a pullback soon in this one. But uh, yeah, fantastic looking stock. Uh, best stock in the world. <laughs> but wait for pullbacks, and then what I was looking at is this uh, overhead resistance at two. If it gets to two, I'll be a very happy camper. Okay. Uh, K R O, K R O, uh, too flat lately. Okay, draw your lines, draw your sideways lines. Which one to have a position in? T uh, T G, T G B, N A K. I usually point out if I have positions in anything that's outside of the service, but the portfolio is published, so I feel like I don't have to disclose anything there because uh, I already did. Uh, NAC looks okay. It's been on my watch list. I, it's a tough one. Uh, HV is kind of high. It's okay. Uh, you know, maybe in or above, let's say around 230 or so with a stop down here. But that's a very, 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 very aggressive type of trade, okay? Uh, HV, I think you missed the note here. Stopped at 241, one cent under high from a few months ago. Added more here with the stop. Low of the day. Yeah, well, Phil, you're a little bit more active, so I, I hear you, uh, HOV. Yeah, I mean, this actually is starting to look pretty good as a new trade in and of itself. Um, kind of that knockout-ish type of move, and that's, like we said earlier, you know, they downgraded it and knocked some people out, so it could take off again. Okay. KRO, what did we talk about that one? Well, I know we have a few left, but, yeah, we talked about that. Tusk, but we're out of time, so let me go ahead and wrap things up. Uh, in here, uh, wait for this one to break out the new highs and then look to play a pullback along the way. Uh, as usual, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you guys being here. It looks like we broke some attendance records, so that's kind of exciting. Um, anything unanswered, daviddavelander.com. If we don't talk to you now and then, everybody have a great weekend. And, again, thank everybody for coming, and I hope to see you all again next week. Thank you so much.